thank you for being present, for being near. God, I just ask in these moments together that wherever we're at, whatever we brought in with us, that, that we would set it before you. Maybe we haven't told a soul yet. Maybe we haven't even had a word with you about it yet. Just pray, God, for the courage to just lay it before you first, maybe then by extension to find a brother or sister and, and lay it before them. We might not walk alone and recognize that we're not alone. You're present. And so this morning has been a gift already, a demonstration of your grace. And uh, we want to sit in it, recognize it, respond in it. So God, continue to move and work particularly and corporately as we continue through the morning. In Jesus' name. Those in agreement said, amen. Um, so uh, this week was, uh, just got off to a rough start for me and uh, didn't really turn until I got a text from a friend who, it was just kind of shocking, like th this is a, a friend you do not expect to be just near your home. Uh, he lives in Oahu, and so he texted me Tuesday, I think it was Tuesday late afternoon, like uh, text me says, hey, I'm in sweet home. And who outside of the state is ever in sweet home, right? <laughs> and, uh, and so that was weird. First of all, I'm trying to make the connect. How are those dots connected? How do you end up in, I mean, you're, you're in Oregon. How do you end up in sweet home? Uh, and so we got together just for a quick hour that night. Didn't have a ton of time Tuesday night, but then got and spent the first half of the day on Wednesday together. And um, I remember walking out of the house. My wife just said, enjoy your morning. Just that sense of recognizing that just a friend from out of town would b just be helpful, and it certainly was a gift. And I put him to work yesterday, too, as we, I ripped all the siding off my house and, and uh, <laughs> uh, rewrapped it. So he was a great help yesterday as well. But um, we were able to spend some good time together. And then he said, if you want, he adjusted his flights to go home on Monday instead of Sunday. He had no idea how close he would be uh, to me and, and our church. So he adjusted his flight so he could be here on Sunday. He says, I'll even preach if you want. And so I said, absolutely. And so um, John uh, Boom is here from uh, North Shore, Oahu, and he moved there shortly after. Uh, this, this is a crazy story to me. Uh, shortly after high school, just moved, lived out of his car so he could surf. And he's been there ever since and uh, planted out of a mutual friend of ours church in Honolulu and planted seven years ago on the North Shore um, uh, of Oahu. And he, he describes, I've never been, so, but he describes it as kind of um, country Hawaii. Um, out in the, to think rural, to think the countryside in Hawaii where everything seems so dense in my mind, dense cities and beaches, um, to think about country. And, and so... Um, uh, planted a church there. Seven years, you said? Seven years. And uh, met his wife, and they have three kids, and are serving faithfully there. And he was in town to, to hang out with some pastors over in Sun River. And again, uh, we got to spend a couple of days together. So uh, this morning, John's going to preach. So would, uh, Valley Life, would you welcome uh, Pastor John Boom? Thanks. Is this sealed? All right. <laughs> sealed. We're good. Can't be too careful these days, right? Um, well, hey, thanks again um, just for having me. I'm so happy to be here uh, worshiping with, with you all. Um, and again, just the, just the worshipfulness of the first service uh, was so good uh, for my soul. Just this whole trip uh, to me, there's not many places um, where I go where I'm impressed, right? I live in Hawaii, um, and it's beautiful. <laughs> it's, Oregon is beautiful. Um, so this has just been a, such a, a cool trip uh, for me. Um, again, uh, so I've been in Hawaii for almost half my life now. Um, anybody see the movie North Shore Surf? It's like an old 80s movie. That was my life inspiration. I just wanted to be like Rick Kane. He, was, he grew up in Arizona, learned how to surf in a wave pool. That's how the movie goes. And then he's like, I just want to move on to bigger, better things. And he just 
flew to Oahu and went to the North Shore. I was like, I could do that. And so that's what I did. Um, that's all I wanted to do. Uh, clearly, I was just living in a car, um, just a surf bum. But then uh, God, uh, in his providence, uh, did something different in my life, went a whole different direction than I was um, wanting or expecting, uh, but I am so just joyful. My, I couldn't have a better uh, life, I feel like. I, I'm not gonna, usually people from Hawaii, they try to say, oh, it's so hard living in paradise, don't be fooled. Like, I'm not gonna fool you. Like, I love living in Hawaii. Like, I love being able to surf a couple times a week when I want, like, in board shorts all throughout the years. Like, December's coming. Like, I just... We go swimming at the beach. That's what we do um, all year long, and I love it. I'm grateful to, to be there. Um, definitely look me up if you guys are traveling to um, Hawaii, uh, to Oahu, where I'm at. Um, but again, just so encouraged to be worshiping with, with family. Um, I tell my, I got three little kids, two, four, and six, um, so not that busy, but a little bit busy. Um, but uh, it just, I love teaching them, like, how we just have, fa- like, because we have conference at Acts 29, and like, who are these guys? Who are you talking to? And I just love teaching my kids, like, we can go anywhere in the world, and there's family there. Like, they'll just invite us into their homes. Like, they'll just, you know, we could just, we have people we, who would love us and who would just be there for us. Um, and I feel that. And so, so thank you. Um, the worship is just so good. Um, so this morning, I'm going to be in Luke 11, uh, teaching on Jesus' instruction to his disciples on the Lord's Prayer. And um, I'll just give a little, I didn't do this first service, but I think it's helpful to think about the context of, of Luke. So um, right before, at the end of chapter 10, is the story of Mary and Martha, Martha and Mary, um, when, when Jesus goes to their house and, and, and they're Mary and Martha are both serving, but then at some point Mary stops serving and, and doing duties and she's just going and sitting at Jesus' feet. And um, Martha goes to, to Jesus, don't you care I'm doing all this work by myself? And, and like, t- t- tell the woman to get back in the kitchen basically is what Martha is saying. And Jesus is like, Martha, Martha, no, no, no. Um, she's actually chosen the better portion, to, to the, the, something that can't be taken away from her, which is to be with me, to be sitting at my feet. And this is the, the context that, that this, um, the Lord's Prayer is in, which tells us that prayer is not, some, it's not a duty. It's not a Christian duty. It, it, it is a discipline. It's, we should have it as a part of a discipline in our lives. But it's more than a duty. It's, a, it's, it's something that fosters a relationship with the Lord. Um, and that's the context that this is in. And I'm just hoping that, that, this, uh, that, that this teaching, Jesus' teaching on prayer, would serve to just uh, take us into a greater um, experience of intimacy with the Lord that would just continue to grow uh, because that's what, that's the point of this, of, of Jesus' teaching here on prayer. And so, let me just pray for us before we uh, get into Jesus' text, his little lesson on prayer. Lord, I thank you for, again, the ability, the gift of communion with you and thinking that while we were sinners, while we were happy to separate ourselves from you, living in hostility toward you, in brazen rage and hatred of you, our God and our creator. You did not give us what you should have in your justice, but instead you sent your son Jesus the great high priest who's also the lamb to be slaughtered, to take away our sin, to take away the hostility that stood between us and to reconcile us back into a right relationship with you. Lord, I pray that you would help us now to consider you and your desire to be close to us and that you would stir in us greater affections to want to draw near to you. I pray that for my brothers and sisters right now. It's in Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. So Luke chapter 11, I'm just going to start in verse 1. We're going to go to verse 13. 
I'm going to read the text and then uh, we'll work through it. So Luke 11, starting in verse 1. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we ourselves forgive everyone else who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me, the door is now shut. And my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And so that's the text that we will be in. Now, immediately what struck me when I was studying this is that how short, how condensed of a, a lesson on prayer this is. Like you would expect when, when, when Jesus finally gets to ask, right? Jesus has been, if you read through, look, he's nonstop praying. Like he's a busy man, busy schedule of people just flooding him, wanting his attention, and he's giving them attention so he would be exhausted after ministering to people all throughout the day, every day, almost 24-7, except for the times when he just separates himself, goes up a mountain because that's the only place where he could be alone, because everyone else is too exhausted and tired to follow him. So he's going to go up a mountain, pray all night into the morning hours, and then get up and do ministry again. Jesus was clearly committed, had a, had a very active prayer life. So it's not a surprise that his disciples would ask him, well, teach us to pray. But what's surprising to me is that rather than Jesus saying, all right, well, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. And sends two of his boys to, to go on ahead of him to find a concert, a conference center, so they could put on a conference about how to pray. You know, like we're going to plan out the plenary sessions and the breakout sessions. It's going to be a weekend full, jam-packed of content to teach you all how to pray. It's not like that at all. It consists of four sentences. Just four sentences of his teaching on how to pray. Yet as simple as this little prayer structure is, a simple way for us to pray, it's also extremely powerful and complex when we begin to fill in this structure. So Steve Jobs had the same conviction while designing Apple products, right? He wanted his products, the vision of Apple was for his products to be user-friendly, so any idiot can use it, like myself, that's why I do Apple, right? Not, not a Galaxy, I'm not smart enough for those kind of smartphones. So very user-friendly, but very powerful, very effective, like a, kind of like a tool, right? My, I'm, I'm, so I'm a carpenter, I'm bivocational, I have my own little construction company, I'm a tool guy, and my favorite tool, are, are there any carpenters in, in, in the room? Like, I was shocked, the first, all right, so Festool, that's my brand, I love Festool, it's super expensive, but worth every penny, it is so just simple, efficient, effective, like dust collection, it's a beaut, they're beautiful, they make beautiful, very helpful tools, like I just, people, I do stuff, I'm like, wow, it's Really, it's festival. It's not me. It's the tool that makes, it, makes my work look so good. 
That's how this prayer teaching is. User-friendly, but extremely powerful, extremely effective, particularly in how it, cont- it fosters a dynamic relationship with the Lord. That's what we're going to see here. There's a lot of differences between modern technologies and prayer, but perhaps the biggest difference is accessibility, right? Where technology and tools, they can be expensive, you got to save up to get it, or you got to wait for, for them to be manufactured and sent to your local dealer. Prayer can happen anytime and anywhere. So four sentences teaching us how to pray and what to pray. And then there's two analogies that help motivate us to pray with confidence. It's as if Jesus really knows the mind of man. Like I love going through Luke. It just regularly says like, no big deal. Like he knew their thoughts. And so he said like, that's what Jesus is doing here without Luke telling us. He knows all the excuses we'll make for why we don't pray, right? Feelings of unworthiness, had a bad week, bad day, fell into some sin, or just don't got time. I got to go. Got stuff to do. Things need to get done. I can't just sit here and pray. Whatever the reason is, Jesus pulls the rug out from underneath us, leaving us with no excuse for why we would not pray, but instead giving us all of this motivation and reason, a desire to pray. And I hope that's what happens for us this morning as we just look through this text. So I want to first start with the two analogies that Jesus kind of gives us towards the end of our our text for this morning. And then we'll go back to the structure. So in these two analogies, we could break it up. The first one, right, about Jesus giving us an analogy about a friend going to do his other friend. He's identifying, he's telling us what it's like to be the one praying or the prayer. And then in the second analogy, where Jesus is talking about a father, right, in that one, it's kind of like he's talking about the one who hears your prayer. So two analogies that motivate us to pray. So let's look first at the one who prays. So in this first analogy, Jesus compares the prayer, the one praying, to a friend whom he knows, who he feels no embarrassment, no problem going to in the middle of the night to ask him a favor. You have a friend like that? You got a boy or a girl? Just that's, that's, that's your person who no matter what it is. Maybe it's not just something tragic or you, you, you need a favor, but like when something good happens, like that's the first person you're gonna call because you just, you, want, you have to share it and you wanna celebrate that moment with, with your best friend, whoever this person is. Or when something is going down and you need help, you're desperate. Doesn't matter what time of day it is, you know that you can wake this person up you don't feel embarrassed, like you don't feel like ashamed for asking. That's just, that's your friend. Of course, you, you, there's no one else you would go to. And they would be upset if you didn't go to them. You got someone like that in your life? I would just kind of pause and, and, and just challenge you. If you don't, maybe your priorities have been a little skewed lately. Because the Christian life, Jesus is clearly using this as an analogy to help us understand what what it's like to pray and to go to a friend. Jesus commands us, and the Christian life is designed for us to live in community. Now, we're not going to all be best friends, but we should all have that one friend. That's a godly, just Christian thing. And it's helpful to understand this analogy that Jesus is, is, is using to teach us. Your heavenly father, here's what Jesus is saying. Your heavenly father is the best of friend. Better than your best friend who you know you can call any time, any day and ask and, and they'll give it to you if they have it. He is always 
available and he's never irritated when you go to him. He's never disappointed or bothered when we would approach him with something. I love this text in 1 Samuel 12, 22. And in the context here, this is when the, the Israelites were, were begging Samuel to appoint a king over them because they wanted to be just like the other nations. And then Samuel's like, ah, that's not how this is supposed to go. Like you, you're forsaking really the Lord. And, and, and they repent and they're like, pray for us. And this is Samuel's prayer for them. And then what he tells them, or I'll just tell them what, what he tells them. And this is the word of the Lord. 1 Samuel 12, for the Lord will not forsake his people. This is right after they had sinned. He assures them the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. And this is true of us today if you're his child. If this church is your church and you're a part of this, this body, this local church, this is true of you. The Lord will not forsake you because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. This is amazing to think about Scripture and how it teaches us the feelings that God has toward you and me. The holy God of the universe who dwells in unapproachable light promises that he will not forsake you no matter how your day, your week, your month, your year has been. And instead, he expects us to come to him however we are. So Jesus promises. Rather, he commands. Look again at verses 9 and 10. Here's the command. And I tell you, the command, ask. That's a command. Ask. Here's the promise. And it will be given to you. Another command, seek. Promise, and you will find. Command, knock. Promise, and it will be open to you. Followed with another promise. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Here is the point that Jesus is making here right now. Two points. First one, that it's not what you do, but who you are that attracts God's attention. It is not what you do, but who you are as his child that attracts his attention that assures that keeps his eye focused on you isn't that beautiful second point our prayers don't get answered because of what we do or what we don't do they get answered because of who god is this is the gospel just how the gospel functions. And it's really a gospel-centered prayer. Look at the next one. Father. So here's the one who hears. And we've kind of already talked about this a little bit. But I'm a dad. Like, and I, like, one of my favorite things in this world is being a dad. Like I, I got two, three kids, two, four, and six, so, right? They're all young. And one of my, my, my middle child, she's four, she's about to be five, she crawls in our bed every night, like every night. And we teach her, like we're trying to train her, like you, you need to stay in your bed, like mommy and dad, we wake up and we're just kind of tired because you're rolling and kicking and she, were, she lays perpendicular to us. So like her face is like on my face and feet are on my wife's face and just trying to train her like, but really, at the, like, it's, it's more my wife who does it. Like, I love it. I just love when she comes in. Like, I'm, I'm affectionate, right? That's just kind of how I am. Like, and I love when she comes in and cuddles with me. It's, it's, I, I, when she comes in, it doesn't bother me at all. And sometimes when my wife wakes up, which is always, like, I don't wake up till she's, like, on my face. But Jansen will say, bring her back into her room. 
But sometimes I don't want to. I just kind of scoot her closer to me. <laughs> just let her lay with me. That's kind of like what Jesus is saying, how your heavenly Father feels about you and me when we pray. He expects us, he commands us to go to him with a sense of entitlement. Really, expecting to hear for that, expecting that he's going to pay attention to us, just like a child would their father or their, their mommy. That's the way Jesus is teaching us to pray. It is so relational. It is not duty. I mean, it's part of it. It's discipline, right? But it is, you see how seeped in relationship and communion it is with the Lord? If you're struggling, just feel like distant from the Lord, this is what you need to do first and forever is to begin to pray like Jesus teaches us to pray and to pray with this kind of assurance that Jesus teaches about this friend who goes to his other friend in the middle of the night and, and just also like with the assurance of how Jesus gives us a knowledge about a father. Right? If we're evil know how to give our kids good gifts, how much more the heavenly father who knows exactly what you and I need before we ask. Now let's move to the prayer structure. Back up in, in the verse 2. So Jesus says, when you pray, say, Father. Now Luke even omits heavenly Father. Matthew and Mark in their teaching on this, they, they put that, Jesus prays, heavenly Father. Clearly Jesus taught this, you know, regularly. And Luke focuses on the point where Jesus just says, just Father, to emphasize again, just how approachable this God is. The pagans believed that to gain the attention of the gods, there was these special formulas, a string of elaborate titles, even self-infliction in order to get the attention of their God or their gods. But in contrast, Jesus teaches that all it takes to get the attention of our Heavenly Father is to just Go up to him, cry out to him, Father. That's it. No padding of the ego. No, no, no tricks to try to impress him and get his attention or earn his favor. You just go to him just like a child. Dad, this is beautiful. In many ways, it's hard to believe. Father, hallowed would be your name. And I'm going to spend the most time unpacking this, this part um, just because in my experience, personal experience of trying to pray through this, ascribing glory to the Lord is oftentimes one of the most challenging and difficult things for us to do. Primarily because we're just proud sinners who are usually looking out to exalt and glorify ourselves. But that's why this is so important. This is, this is the place to start. Hallowed be your name. What does this mean? To hallowed, well, it just, it just means to ascribe glory. Okay, so how do we do it? Where do we start? Um, so I get to do this for you because so many people do this to me when they visit Hawaii. They're just, we're driving around, they're like, oh my gosh, look at that mountain. Wow, the water's so blue and clear. Oh, it's just so warm all the time, or it's too hot, or whatever. Like, I'm, like I just drove up from, so we're staying in Sisters, and I drove, or no, I drove through Sisters. Sisters was cool, but drove from Sweet Home up the 20 through the mountain. It was all, it was like snowing, which um, wasn't that cool. Uh, <laughs> it was like a wet snow, too. Um, drove through Sisters and then down to uh, Sun River 
just beautiful everywhere. It's like picture, 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 picture. And then I had to go drive down from, us. we're staying in Bend. Uh, some things happened with my trip, uh, thanks to the wonderful state of Hawaii and their handling of things. So I had to drive to Portland to get a COVID test so I could get back home. The only place in, in the state that I could get a test that the state of Hawaii will accept. <laughs> I was, Bend was cool. Like I wanted to stay in Bend but I had to go to Portland. But as soon as I started driving, I, was, I went a different route, the 97, through Hood Mountain. I'm from Long Beach, from the Hood, and um, your guys' Hood is a little different. I like it. It's beautiful. Good place to grow up. But I literally just like, what are all these colors? I, in Hawaii, we don't have seasons. I forget, like, the rest of the world, you have seasons, and, and seasons, like, things actually change. Not just the temperature, but, like, the leaves. Like, it's just always green. It's either green or if we do get it, like, we get droughts. It's either green or brown in Hawaii, one or the other. We don't have reds and oranges and pink reds and orange reds, and yet, like, all the different, I've never seen so many colors, like, like California and then Hawaii. I've never been back east, and I'm just blown away by the color. So I just couldn't help my, I literally like just had worship music cranking. I was like singing, driving down the mountain, top of my lungs, just like this is beautiful. It was just was stirring me up to, to worship. That creation can stir us up to pray, hallowed be your name. That's what David preached or, or what he spoke of in Psalm 8. When he said, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. He went on to say and think and consider, what is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you, you care for him? That helps us to hallowed the name of the Lord. One friend was telling me, He's reading a study that a philanthropist did, and this philanthropist was, was noting that people who live in areas where you can see the stars tend to be a lot more humble in character than people who live in places where they can't see the stars. That makes sense. You just feel big until you look up at the stars, at a beautiful snow-packed mountain, Creation helps us. Hallowed the name of the Lord. But it only takes us so far. It's helpful. But you know what is most helpful? To lead us to a place where we're hallowed be your name rather than our own names? The gospel, the cross. This might be a familiar text for you. You guys have been going through Ephesians. I love Ephesians 2. You know that but God passage when he's talking about at the beginning and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work and the sons of dis... That was you. Dead rebellious, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us up with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages, and here's the text I want to highlight here. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So creation, the world, like there's just like scientists, we like man, like we like to measure. I'm a carpenter, I like to measure things. Like scientists, I like to measure and try to figure things out. 
Like we know how big the earth is, the globe. Like we know the square footage inside and we know how much it weighs. We know how large the sun is. We know galaxies. Like we like to measure and, and count. But you know what's immeasurable? You know what can never be counted? The glorious grace of God. Paul says it's immeasurable. So when we think about the fact that we were rebellious, haters of God, living proud lives as if he's not Lord, not my God, we could live however we want, do whatever we want to do so long as it's good and pleasing and fun and beneficial for me. But God, being rich in mercy, made us alive, gave us new life. When we think about the gospel, when we think about the just wrath that we deserve for offending an infinitely holy God and then going to the cross to see the cost that it required to make atonement for your sins and mine that is something that is immeasurable glory majesty that transcends anything we could ever imagine or understand we're scratching the surface. This, the gospel, meditating on the gospel, what Jesus saved us from, and what he gifted us, new life, communion with him, eternal hope, that leads us and guides us to pray, hallowed be your name. And that's why we start there. And everything builds out from there. Because the thing that what happens is when we begin to ascribe glory to the Lord, when we begin to honor him the way he should be honored, we acknowledge, one, that now we, we do desire, we want to orient our lives to, to live for his glory rather than our own, but simultaneously we are convicted, if we're honest, that we haven't been doing that. We've been living our lives, posting on social media to exalt and glorify ourselves. Every time we say, we pray, hallowed be your name, we must confess that we've failed to live in light of God's sovereign glory and majesty. We're living as if he is not king and God. We fail to hallow the name when we care more about our names being honored and exalted. We fail to hallow the name of the Lord when we do not depend on him for the things that Jesus continues to teach us when he lays out his prayer. Like things like daily bread, things like his kingdom being advanced rather than ours. And so when we begin to work on this, when we begin to pray the way Jesus teaches us how to pray, this simple way of prayer, what becomes immediate to us is when we are engaged here, when we begin to hallow the name of the Lord, we will find that praying like this, it's not always going to guarantee immediate results for the things that we're praying for but the results are immediate in us. See that, how that happens here? Something happens in us when we are praying this way. We're humbled. Suddenly our priorities are different and aligned where they, how they should be. 
with God as King and Lord and the one we feel accountable to, the one we know we're accountable to and want to serve and honor. So we change. Prayer, prayer forces us to change before anything else gets changed. And we so desperately need this in every season. Just think about the season we've been in the past year and a half, right? I don't know about how your, your church has handled just the different political sides. And I have all, I have all types of people in our church, the, the conservatives, the Republicans, the conspiracy theorists, the timid, and just everything. And prayer and humility is the only thing that's going to keep the church together to continue to conform us into the image of Jesus and continue to bind us with the bond of unity through the Holy Spirit. So all this stuff doesn't matter. Not as much as we think it matters. I love what Ian Bounds says in one of his books on prayer. I forget which one it is. But he just gives this, observa- this observation about prayer. He says, quote, How useless is all our fretting, our worrying over trouble as if such unhappy doings on our part could change things. He goes on to say how trouble has wise ends for the praying one. Let me say that again. Trouble has wise ends for the praying one. And these find it so. Happy is he who, like the psalmist, finds that his troubles have been blessings in disguise. And he quotes this this psalm, it is good for me that I have been afflicted. Think about that. How prayer flips things in our hearts and in our minds and when we begin to consider things. The psalmist says, it is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn your statutes. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right and that you and your faithfulness have afflicted me. That's a place, a posture, and a mindset that only a praying person can have. And that's where we're the safest Jesus goes on to teach us, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. There's another check, right? A little heart check. What have we been living for? What have we been doing with our time? This prayer, this statement when we pray this, your kingdom come, this not only checks and reorients our hearts toward what God cares about, but you know what else this helps do? Is it defines or redefines like our purpose? Like our purpose with work, having a job, or retirement, or raising children? We're not just raising kids just so that they'd obey us or we'd have kids that we could be proud of in public. We're raising children up that would honor and glorify the Lord and go out into the world and make disciples and, and be faithful to Jesus and be loving, caring people. That's what we're trying to do as parents, right? We're working. We get up in the morning. We go to work, not just so we could provide more and accumulate and become more comfortable and successful. If that happens, great. But whose kingdom are we building? Whose kingdom are we trying to further and establish? And if you're single, how are you using your time? You got lots of it. To be a church member. What is your purpose as a collective body? What is this church? What is this the mission, the vision of this church to, to continue to advance God's kingdom? This helps reorient our priorities if we were to pray honestly this way. 
And so this prayer reminds us of our just general calling as Christians, that we're to advance God's kingdom, that we're to seek to be those who roll back the curse of sin through good works, through engaging in good deeds, through humbly loving and caring for other people. Who is it in your life that, that God has placed in your life to serve? Who is it in your life that, 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 that God has put you there that you can bless? How can you partner with the church to further advance God's kingdom? That's what, we're, that's what this church is trying to do. And that's why God has gifted you the jobs and the families and the, the skills and the spiritual gifts that, that you have. Not for yourself, but to advance God's kingdom. This prayer really keeps us accountable. This prayer tends to change us before it changes anything else. Can you see it? He goes on to say, give us each day, or just give us each day our daily bread. Um, how do you do that? After a Costco trip, Right? Freezers full of bread? Or are you toilet paper hoarders? Which one are you? We got toilet paper hoarders in Hawaii. White gold. <laughs> I'm a workaholic. Like I saw I'm bivocational. I have my own construction company. I just like working. I, I have a hard time resting. Like I'm just active all the time. And this helps me it screams to someone like me maybe that's you just calm down I'm not holding up the world God's my provider he's going to take care of me he has blessed me with the ability to provide for my family and sometimes what I really need to do is to thank him just thank him. Like I, like I work, I come home, and just, I, I need to thank the Lord for providing jobs for me that I could work and provide for my family. The Lord's your provider. It's not you. He uses you. Like, you should work. Like, on the other side of it, like, so there's workaholics, and then there's people who don't want to work. Like, you should work. There's some bread. Go get it. God's providing you a job. Go work. But know who your provider is. And depend on him. The biggest reason we don't pray is because we don't feel needy. That's why we don't pray. I got this. Success can be one of the greatest deterrents of prayer and of our walk with the Lord because prayer facilitates an intimate walk with the Lord. And then the last one, the second to last one, forgive, forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And here again is the part that you fill in. Here's the structure. What's that sin that we're to, we to ask him for forgiveness for? Isn't it interesting that the repentance part is only being, it's only now in this prayer structure. Have you thought about that? Like I remember just like, wait, the repentance comes like last? Isn't it supposed to come first? But here again, it's not what you do but who you are that attracts God's attention. And again, I think that's why the repentance part is towards the end of this prayer structure. Our prayers don't get answered because of what we do, but because of who God is. He's a father. He wants us to come to him. He wants us. He will discipline. He will correct us for our good. That is such a part of prayer and the Christian walk. And it's a blessing. But just 
sometimes we, we, we think like we've got to clean ourselves up first before we would dare to approach God. Let some time go by. I blew it. I just need to let some time go by and be good for a little bit. Then I'll go and pray. That's not the gospel. I love how the, he, the author of Hebrews tells us that there's a throne of grace and we're to go boldly before that throne. Like we run there. In all our filth and sin and shame, we just go boldly. Prayer is not a religious duty that we check off. It facilitates, it fosters a relationship with the Lord so that we're more like Mary's, sitting at the feet of Jesus, Him being ministered first by Him and then being in awe of who He is as the transcendent, hallowed God who is a father, an intimate father who loves you and cares for you and wants you to come to him. Prayer is relational first. And it has transforming results in us before it transforms or changes anything around us. But prayer does change things. So this is a very simple way to pray, but so powerful. So if you just remember one or two things about prayer, it's not who you are, or no, it's not what you do, but who you are that guarantees God's listening ear, that his eye is on you, that he's waiting for you to come because you're his child. And it's not what you do that guarantees your prayers will get answered, but who God is that will guarantee that he will answer your prayer. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you again for this sweet lesson on prayer that, that shows us just how eager you are to be in a relationship with us. Lord, would you forgive us for thinking of our Christian faith or Christianity as this duty, as nothing more than just religious activities that we fill our lives with rather than being a close, vibrant, intimate walk where we are safe, in your arms, we are taking shelter in you, being cared for, provided for by you and equipped by you to go out and to advance your kingdom. Lord, I pray that this church would grow into being more of a praying church and that we would see so much transformation internally and externally in this community. We pray this for your glory and for our joy. In Jesus' name, amen.